Before we get started today, I wanted to let you know about the upcoming camp events we have. First, we have a benefit concert in collaboration with the New Arts Collaboration that will feature new music by minority composers and performers. It's on Thursday, September 30th at 7 p.m. Pacific Time and 10 p.m. Eastern Time. This concert will only be live streamed on YouTube and will be followed by an open Zoom discussion featuring select performers and composers from the concert. Next, we have In Tempore on Sunday, October 3rd at 7 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be held at the Tamuka Arts White House in Orlando, Florida, and will be both in person and live streamed. And then we have Constellations on Saturday, October 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be held at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Tampa, Florida, and as well will be in person and live streamed. Finally, we have our inaugural Campground Festival from March 24th to the 26th, 2022. We have a call for scores that ends October 31st and a call for performers that ends October 15th. All of this can be found at contemporaryartmusicproject.org under the events section. And now to the podcast. Hi, I'm your host, Zach Hale, and this is Play the Ink, a podcast where we discuss the performer-composer relationship with living musicians, and how the performer can change the way the composer composes, and how the composer can change the way the performer performs. Today on the show, we have Dr. Shishun Chisun Lee, who is a Taiwanese-American composer living in Seoul, South Korea. Her works were described as eye-openly, befittingly complex, but rather arresting to hear by the Boston Globe. Some of her achievements include being the winner of the first Biennial Brandenburg Symphony International Composition Competition in Germany and being a 2015 Guggenheim Fellow. And we have Dr. Haishung Deng, who is a scholar of Chinese music and a master player of the 21-string Chinese Gucheng and is living in Tallahassee, Florida. Some of her achievements include the 2017 Ruby Chow Ye Award from the Association for Chinese Music Research, the winner of the Outstanding Performance Prize at the 1995 Chinese National Zheng Competition in Shanghai, and being a 2018 Florida State University College of Music Research Fellow. We caught up with them on a Saturday morning for me and Hai Chung, and Saturday night for Shishun, since she is in Seoul, South Korea. Shishun, I think one of the interesting things that I've seen a lot of your work and seen your work for things like flute, vibraphone, you know, Western instruments. And then you like to write a lot for, I guess we can call traditional instruments. So Chinese, Japanese, um, and Korean. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very interesting to talk about, um, because not every composer does that. And I think it'd be a good thing to share. And then also, Haishong, you play an instrument that not a lot of people have seen, or so I think, but we can discuss that as well. But so I guess the first thing is just talking about these traditional instruments. In um, So kind of, Shishan, where did you learn how to write or play for these? I'm guessing that they're prevalent in Taiwan, but maybe I'm wrong. So how did you learn about these instruments and how did you learn how to write for them? Yeah, in fact, uh, it is a very good question, by the way. Um, I mean, yeah, when I grew up in Taiwan, uh, my primary... Um, music education systems were all pretty much focused on the Western music per se. But of course, I mean, there are some people actually have a uh, major in traditional instruments like a guzhens, you know, dizi, uh, pipa, et cetera. But yeah, but, but for my side of, <laughs> for myself, I actually were pretty uh, focused on the, um, the Western instrument tr- uh, training. Not until in 1990, one nineteen ninety two, yeah, I think in uh, nineteen ninety one, yeah, I got an um 
commissioned, in fact, my very first piece that I ever written for traditional uh, Chinese instruments actually was a, a commission piece to write uh, for a, a bassoon and a Chinese tr traditional ensemble. So uh, because of this opportunity, so I actually had to research just like, in fact, you know, I feel that, you know, writing for any instrument is not too much difference than actually, you know, writing for the you know, Western instruments. I mean, we all still have to do research, et cetera, and still have to learn, to, you know, the, uh, all the techniques. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it's actually, in a way, it, it, right now, especially, you know, in 21st century, it's such a globalization uh, mindset. Pretty much everybody can do everything. And... Um, so, I mean, yeah, so I, mean, I came across with the, the opportunities and then I learned and then, it's, and then started to study, you know, uh, about writing for the traditional instruments. And I never actually work in, with the performers up until that opportunities. And I didn't even meet with the uh, uh, performers in Taiwan at all until I went to Poland. We met each other in Poland. <laughs> so we had a rehearsals and then they, they flew over to France for world premiere after that. Yeah, so it was actually a very uh, all like, a, you know, out of country experience for me uh, during that time period. And then, yeah, since then, I have been um, um, composed for uh, these mediums and as well as uh, Japanese traditional instruments and Korean traditional instruments as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just like uh, what I mentioned, you know, uh, writing for the traditional uh, instruments. I mean, especially nowadays, there are so many um, resources that people can learn about how to write for the instrument. And in fact, a lot of uh, resources are in English nowadays. And uh, many of them actually are also focused on the contemporary music uh, techniques as well. Yeah, so for the 21st century composers, I think we are all in luck, you know, for, for writing for this type of mediums. So it, in fact, it's really not that challenge for anyone at all. And I mean, just to, to um, talk about an, an example, in fact, uh, one of a traditional Chinese instrument, I mean, uh, for high chance instruments, of course, uh, th there are so many uh, non-Asian composers has been written for Gu Zhen already. And, uh, and also like a, a sheng, you know, like a, the, the mouse organ, the Ch Chinese mouse organ. Sheng, in fact, there are many great uh, sheng concertos that are written by uh, non, like, uh, like uh, Taiwanese, Chinese related uh, composers. I mean, and many of them actually are like uh, Westerners or, yeah, I mean, yeah, the p people are actually having, trying and doing a great job even. To, I mean, that, that, it's, it's like, a, you know, regardless which nationality you're from, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, in a way it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, uh, the process for me now, of course, I got to learn to how to do the traditional way first and then kind of um, elaborate into uh, finding the possibility of doing the contemporary techniques uh, on those instruments. And over the years, really literally over the years, we, Hai Chong and I, we have been working very closely since 1998. <laughs> yeah. I bet there are a lot of people who are listening right now, not even were born in 1998 yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have a really, really little relationships. And I have to say, though, I mean, Hai Chong has been my muse. I mean, basically, yeah, she make everything is possible. And uh, and I I also have to say that really among the, all the traditional instruments, my top pick is always Guzheng because uh, the possibilities of making new sounds and varieties, you know, I, I, I really can just exist all my imagination for sure on that particular instrument, especially with a great musicians like Hai Chong. So I'm, I'm very in luck in that in this case so i guess to ask too so i guess you, you don't play any of these because you have so many great composers that are uh, great performers that you've worked with did you ever try to learn one of them or have one at home to play with oh yes i did in fact <laughs> 
uh, because of Azuran process, this particular mm -hmm. in uh, this particular piece, I actually literally bought a guzhen from a Dunhuang guzhen, yeah, a home to try out all the possibilities that I can do that I have not done, you know, by then. But but uh not not for professionally uh, perform per se at all. But I mean to try out you know different techniques etc. Yes, I I do own one mm -hmm. at home, and in fact uh. My husband, Michael Timpson, is also a, a composer too, and he collected a lot of traditional instruments. So we we do actually have a, like a display uh, a case of like a, a lot of different wind instruments from all different part of worlds. Yeah, so I mean, it's I think it's really necessary, especially you know when I've been uh, doing uh, like a writing for the the Japanese traditional instruments or Korean traditional instrument. It's quite important to actually get you know in hand or with all those instruments and then try it out yeah so mm -hmm. some of the techniques literally it is re really i have to take on the instruments or like you know try on the guzhens or, or etc to actually kind of extend the possibility of uh, extended techniques so a lot of things is kind of you know really are creations, not just the music itself, but the techniques themselves as well. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I just remember myself writing for trumpet or something. And even if you can't play trumpet, you should try just to learn what it feels like for the person playing, you know, what it's going to be like and say, that's hard for me. I'm sure it's hard for them. And I don't know, you think about it, but I think that's interesting to own the instruments that you're exploring and not just uh, theorizing in your head, you know, what it's going to sound like. But. Yeah, I mean, that's really, yeah, that, that's extremely important. And in fact, you know, in the educational sort of mind, I think, it, you know, I always encourage all my students to actually have a very close relationship with performers. In fact, that's their lesson 101, you know, for all my composition students. It's like, okay, you're writing for the violin solo piece. Guess what? Your job right now, besides just reading, you know, the orchestration books, etc., you go find a musician. Test out all the possibilities that you can. And then also explore the other possibilities that the people might not even have done before, you know, with the performer directly. So I think, you know, that's definitely the best. Because, you know, at the same time, when you're working with the performers, you can also ensure whatever you are writing, it's, you know, it's doable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I didn't know that, this. Mm -hmm. th this is a question. So was this piece uh I got to remember how to say it, Zusammenfluss? Did you work with Haishong on that? Or no? <laughs> And um, this particular piece actually was the commissions for another uh, Guzheng prayer in Taiwan for his recital, and it was commissioned by the the National Council Hall. Yeah, so um, I at, at that time I was actually uh, work close to. I mean. Okay, I should say this. Uh, a lot of experience and the techniques that I, uh, a lot of techniques that I used in this particular piece, I did already work with Haichong previously, because uh, in 2003, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I got a, um, a commission from Hoverfront to compose a Zen uh, Concerto for Haichong. So at that time, I did already explore quite a lot of different possibilities. And then later on, uh, there are quite a lot of opportunities that I have bothered her to <laughs> perform my music or explore the different possibility of uh, uh, techniques, etc. So I did actually already learn a lot from her. But then uh, in addition to that, I mean, when I work on the Zuren Francis, as I mentioned, because, you know, I'm kind of in the stage that I want to create something that I never done before, or I never actually in encounter before that I can find it from the, you know, any of the videos or, or pre-existing compositions. So I literally went and bought an instrument myself. 
to try out. <laughs> so, so in a way, it's not only just be, be you know working close with the performers, but at the same time, yeah, get on the hands of the instruments and I try out the techniques. Yeah, so a lot of like a harmonics concept, you know, how to both certain locations on the bridge to come out with certain harmonic uh, uh, sounds, etc. Those are all very precisely been notated, and it's, it's you know because I do actually work on the instrument directly to come up with all those sounds. And then, uh, I mean, besides, yeah, um, uh, Hai Chong, the, 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 um, the Zen player who I work with in Taiwan who commissioned me to write, write this piece, he was also very open-minded. So, yeah, I mean, we have had, uh, done a lot of very fun techniques and, and also make the music really Blossom, I hope. <laughs> yeah, in this case, you know, it was, everything's all composite together. That's very interesting about the bowed part because I actually watched it and said, I don't think that's part of like the, you know, normal techniques. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting <laughs> that you brought it up because I said, oh, I won't talk about it. But <laughs> all right, well, then we can go. I can kind of then talk to you, uh, Hai Chung, about how did you learn how to play? And is this something that was just everybody was doing it or did was it special that you chose the zhong during my time i learned this instrument when i was very young and that was late 1980s in china uh, in that period china was not as prosperous as today uh, like many kids has the opportunity have the opportunity to learn music so the guzheng is definitely one of the most popular chinese musical instruments but at my time, at, uh, in the late 1980s, it was not. Very few families um, could afford, actually, their own kids to study music. And I was lucky. And my father taught me the violin. That, that was my first instrument when I was three. Did very bad, and I stopped at six. And the, one of my father's friends taught me Chinese hammer dulcimer. Mm -hmm. uh, for free at that, that time a lot of that just came out of friendship so he really taught me like six years uh, hammer dulcimer and i was majoring that instrument and when i was eight uh, my mom uh, none of my families really saw instrument like guzheng before and never and even not heard about this and my mom heard this name and she thought it was the harp <laughs> Because there's a painting about music, like harp on the wall. So uh, in my city, it was in the western, uh, northwestern China. And uh, a lot of um, like top musicians were sent to my hometown during the Cultural Revolution. So our city is not like Shanghai, Beijing, very uh, like advanced in general. Um, so uh, late 1980s, China was opening up. So they're starting this kind of first generation of private uh, like music school concept. So those teachers, the uh, first generation professional trained in China, um, first able to, you know, so they, they want to study a school, like a pre-conservatory uh, school uh, in my city. So they start to accrue kids. So my mother saw the new uh, advertisement, so she just wanted to test my ear if my ear was right. So I went there, they thought my ear was quite good and I can sing exercise, you know, all Yangqing exercise. So they were quite impressed. Uh, Yangqing is the Chinese hammer a dulcimer, uh, the, the name. And then my, they asked me what instrument I want to learn. My mom said, the guzheng, you know, cause, but none of them really saw the guzheng. So that's my first time actually, you know, when I walk into my teacher's uh, very uh, nice gentleman, uh, elderly gentleman, his house, first time I really see the, um, you know, saw the guzheng. Mm. So that started my guzheng. Uh, career basically and then when i was 12 my teacher recommended me to uh, to to get into the conservatory i never heard about conservatory in china if you want to be a professional musician you have to like get into the pre school of conservatory when you were 12 very competitive they only accepted two person per major per year nationwide very competitive i was lucky and i got into the cn conservatory of music uh, when i was 12 and I left my hometown when i was 12 because i have to take 12 hour train to go to the school boarding school so that started my guzheng learning path so 
actually, you know, my journey with Zhi Chun is kind of interesting because she grew up this Western trained, uh, you know, composer path and in, start encounter, uh, encountering with the Chinese music when basically become a professional musician that started when she's a dot. And I'm totally opposite. I started so-called professional training in traditional Chinese music. 10 years, I went, you know, conservatory. I graduated from Shanghai Conservatory uh, for my bachelor's. And all the repertoires I played when I was in China were composed by Chinese composers. Even though it's concertos, this kind of a new concept borrowed from Western you know, classical music, uh, still they're composed by Chinese composers. Until when I went to New York uh, to participate uh, to a half year a tour, performing tour invited by music from China, quite a prestigious uh, ensemble. That was the first time I encountered with Zhi Chun's music, Michael's music. And uh, I think from that point on, it started a brand new journey for me. Yeah, so <laughs> starting point. <laughs> I think that year, that year was 1999, Zhi Chun. I think it's, it's not 1998. Really? I thought it was 98. I think it's 99. Yeah, 1999. Because I remember 98. Really? Yes, at 98 in Kansas at, at that time. Yeah. Really? Uh, wow. Oh my gosh! Then that, my memory got wrong. Anyway, it's a, around that time. It's, yeah. yeah. First time I came to the U.S., ne I never thought I would come to the U.S. because it's nothing related to what I grew up. You know, the culture, training, the mindset. So that's the kind of breakthrough <laughs> time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I have to mention something though. Our first encounter experience, hmm. you know, Haichun definitely like, you know, put me in shock. Okay, I mean, if people know about my music, they probably would never think anyone in the world would ever memorize my piece in three weeks. Okay. I, I'm not even talking about just memorize my music that is already kind of ah, insane. Yeah, but I mean, she did it. I mean, Hai Chong did it. I mean, and then she took three three weeks to learn my piece and she was on stage. And, you know, and I still remember there were like audience break down tears because the piece was related to William Albright who passed away and, and it's like in memory of her, of him. Yeah, so I mean, Hai Chong's uh, performance was so in touch with all the audience at that time I and I was purely in shock <laughs> that's all that's amazing yes it's awesome I mean really seriously I mean as a composer I have to you know knock on the wood and then you know just being very lucky really I'm just so lucky to yeah, actually you know have Hai Chong as my uh, you know muse, as performer you yeah muse yeah and then then I mean Really, I mean, just just like uh, you know, it has been a, a very amazing uh, journey. I mean, Haichun did two other solo pieces of mine uh, this year. Both are memorized too. I don't, I literally didn't even know how she did it, but she did it. It's just, yeah, she's an amazing musician for sure. So this is an interesting topic. Kind of like we can go on a tangent here, but um, funny enough. I studied with the Taiwanese percussionist uh, Ayun Huang, and she is all about memorizing. And uh, and when I was doing my degree, a lot of things were about memorizing. Do you memorize or try to memorize all the pieces that you play, Aishong? Or well, no. Uh, well, it depends. Uh, for solos, I think I have to, because uh, if I still looking at the music, I cannot reach to a level I think a soloist should be. Mm -hmm. But trust me, the practicing process was not fun. Uh, <laughs> it was very challenging. Uh, it's really um, maybe like this, you know, that since the first time I met Chichun, all you know, and the 20 years in, in the last two decades, is like uh, Chichun provide this path for me to restudy my instrument. Because I the pain side is not from just uh, memorize finding the notes. It's really um, I have to break down my old way, old mindset of thinking and looking at the instrument. Every piece I have to endure a kind of reborn myself. Okay, I have to 
quiet down myself. Okay, this is a new thing I have to restudy. Okay, this is the because every tuning set is different. We can talk about later, um, and I have to literally study every string. Every pitch, you know, every string is different pitch. It's not like piano E is E, uh, A sharp is A sharp. It's not. <laughs> and then <clears throat> the piece concept, none of her piece even similar or close to the repertoires I played in China. It's like two cultures, even though I'm using two, uh, one instrument. Uh, so it's um, the beginning was painful, especially the first time I went to New York. It's a a tremendous amount of new music. And uh, yeah, I memorized different pieces because I'm used to that level, you know, performance level. I, I cannot endure just looking at the music and play the notes. I myself cannot, <laughs> you know, went over that. Uh, I cannot endure it, so I have to memorize it. And then through that process, I feel, oh, wow, the Gu Zheng can express like this. Very effective. I, lo- I love that piece. Um, but that piece, consider her later pieces, uh, is traditional. If you hear her later pieces, is especially the the, the last piece uh, I practiced. Every piece is, you know, is McKay. like McKay. McKay, yes, yes, McKay. <laughs> How a composer, you know. And especially during the McKay, you know, Zhuchun brought her instrument. See, you can play like this, play like that. You know, I, re- I studied the instrument with her. I said, oh, yeah, how come I never thought the instrument can be played like this way? Oh, yeah, she looks so easy, but how come I, I just couldn't do it? You know, it's so funny, this mutual way. And then so, yeah, basically, you know, playing Zhuchun's piece is um, forced me to open my mind. It's mind opening constant. You know, every time I've after play a piece, I feel like, okay, great. Yeah, I'm open-minded. You know, I'm all flexible enough. No next piece come, I was like, oh my gosh, true. Okay, anyway. You know, every time again and again I start to get familiar with this mental process. So I become more patient. When I practice my key, same thing. I have this uh, deadline. I have to practice this piece in I, f- I forgot six weeks or five weeks. And I have tons of other things. I feel like, okay, clear my mind. I have to come back to this professional conservatory kind of uh, practicing mode, you know, because at conservatory, basically, we just practice, practice, practice like eight hours a day. And at this age, okay, concentrate. So for the four, first the four weeks, basically just get familiar with the notes, patience. Okay, why the rhythm is like like this? I I, I felt like this is better, but Jishun said no, it's too slow. I felt it's too slow. He she said it's no faster. You know, I'm processing this information, and then last the two weeks, yes, and the, at the end when I memorized, I felt like oh, I finally understand a little bit of her original thinking. So it's really learning process. <laughs> yeah, I I think it's so interesting that it kind of permeates life. I think like you said, when you do it so much and you're so open minded. I always feel like it's always permeated my life once I stop doing music. You know, I go to the store, or I go to a job and I have to work with someone, you know, on a different level. It's like, wow, that this kind of feels like I got this from music, maybe. So <laughs> it definitely has an influence. Indeed. Yeah. So that's actually great. I think this goes kind of into one of the other topics, not that we have to go in order here, but um, I guess the notational thing. So I didn't know that each piece has a different tuning system i guess that you reach you retune the strings so how do you notate that (laughs) that's a good question and and is it normally notated i guess that's the other question um when you learn traditional instruments and i don't know if it's something like where there's traditional maybe not hymns is not the right word that's the word i have in my mind for a western thing but something that you would do how how is that notated in traditional things not in western notation yeah, maybe I start from traditional way, uh, and then you know we can have a clear idea about how Zhuchun become innovative. Um, the Gu Zheng is a zither, as Zach mentioned before. It's a, like twenty one strings, the standard one today, and we also have sixteen strings. Uh, used to be steel strings, and under each string there's a movable bridge uh, for tuning or changing scales. Traditionally, we tune the Gu Zheng or Zheng Gu Zheng, spelled G U Z H E N G. Gu basically means ancient. And in the past, throughout history, the instrument was called the Zheng, Z-H-E-N-G. So today, the people popularly call it the Gu Zheng because it's an ancient instrument. The Gu Zheng was tuned uh, traditionally most in pentatonic scale. 
So pentatonic scale is a five notes scale, like da da di da da, not a da da di da 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 di da. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't have fa and t only do re mi so la. And the way we play traditional pieces is we use the right hand to pluck the right side of the bridge, which is tuning to perfect pentatonic uh, skill, to pluck the strings. And I use our left hand to bend the left side of the strings to create all kinds of stylistic bendings or uh, you know ornamentations. So that's the major part of traditional uh, flavor, I would say, because in China, it, the Zheng tradition has different traditional schools are associated with, uh, you know, like northern or western local dialects and local operatic music, very strong flavors. So we, during my training, we were focused on how to bend precisely, create, you know, be authentic of the style, the traditional style, different schools. That's the key. And also, because this nature of playing, most of traditional pieces are, uh, I call it uh, uh, lineal, because it's a like a melodic line. It's not chordal progression. It's a, mel a melodic line and very focused on left hand bendings. And uh, so that's the kind of basic image of traditional playing, pentatonic scale and a single melody, a, a line with a lot of nuanced left hand bendings. And then, then we can pass to Jichun to talk about how she recreate this instrument, you know, and each piece uh, use the flexibility of the instrument and to, to suit her uh, uh, sound image. You know all the other things. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, just like Haichun said, uh, yeah. I mean, the traditional uh, Zen tuning or all pentatonic scales and primaries are in the D pentatonic scale, G pentatonic scales, and yeah, I think those two are the most common one, and then you will alter from there. So, I mean, basically, uh, yeah. So, so. The, we total have, I mean, Guzheng has a 21 string. So for me, I was so happy because the movable bridges actually give me a lot of, you know, uh, possibilities that to actually, you know, do the scoratora tuning. Yeah. And uh, my idea is that, you know, I mean, as a con contemporary music composers, you know, I, I tend like to think about that, okay, I, I need all my all 12 notes, otherwise I would die. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's just the concept of like, oh, okay, you know, the, the 12 notes, yeah, that, that is quite important. Now, you know, nowadays there are even uh, composers actually purposely tuning microtone event. Yeah. So, I mean, for this particular instrument, it, everything is possible. Now, uh, I do actually tell people sometimes, or like I encourage my students, you know, when we try to retune the guzhen or any traditional zither instruments, you know, try to start from their traditional tuning first, and then we just, you know, move mildly. Yeah. So like, you know, you can do like a half step lower or, high, or half step higher, you know, to kind of, you know, create the, the, the different uh, tuning concept. And uh, it took me quite some time, you know, to actually work out a system to actually uh, make a scale that will actually work, uh, work well for each one of a piece. But now think about this, like, you know, each one of a piece, you know, I can create my own own scales so they the sounding the 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 uh, the, the color of the music it would be definitely quite different you know just even based on different scales that i've been tuning for the the instruments yeah so i mean it gave me a lot of you know possibilities in comparison to all the other traditional instruments and uh and I more and more learned how to utilize, you know, the uh, scoratora tuning, so I can freely actually create any type of the traditional scale sounding music within the uh, twelve tone tuning uh, system on the guzhen. So, for instance, like. Uh, um, uh, let's just talk about the example that I wrote for uh, Hai Chong, uh, the Dots Lines Convergence, the Guzheng Concerto, which I think that maybe you remember it. I think it, they, they performed it while you were at USF as well. 
Probably, yeah, so for I didn't that, realize, yeah. yeah, yeah. So for that particular piece, I mean, again, it's a scriptura tuning on Gu Zhen. So if it actually goes on, to, uh, like a, a just scrape the strings from the 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 lowest strings up to the highest string, it this it would actually sounds like uh, you know all very twelve tone type of you know sounding. Uh, tuning scale as uh, aspect. But for that particular piece, the second movement is completely Asian. So how to actually approach that mindset, but within the same tuning without actually retunes or anything, you know, in the middle of a piece, that's become, you know, one of the um, fun tests that I like, like to do, you know, on this particular I instrument. And I have to say that I, uh, should be told, um, I mean, Hai Chong has been amazing because to deal with scriptor uh, tuning, every piece, they, they, I mean, it's all different tuning for sure. I mean, the tuning process is take time already, but for the musicians, uh, the performers to be able to adapt the new scale and then, you know, be able to get used to, you know, how they can perform to the, the strings that actually also take a lot of practice and talents for sure. Now, uh, I do also encounter with some of the Guzheng player, they would actually just kind of memo uh, each one of the strings by numbers. And with the traditional tuning uh, concepts, so even the tune, uh, the the scale actually was scriptura, but they memo each one of the strings by their traditional string names, so they would know which you know string to prox when they practice the, the the piece. So yeah, I do actually come across that. So sometimes yeah, like a right now contemporary music uh then pieces they will come with two layers of a scores side by side. One is you know like the the score in C, the other one will be the score in the traditional tuning uh, concept, just to help out uh the Zen player for who might not actually have enough experience like Hai Chong, yeah, to be able to perform contemporary piece that is, you know, tuned it differently than traditional way. Yeah, so I mean, it, it is fun, it's a challenge, but I, yeah, uh, poor, poor musician nevertheless because of them. So there are a lot more music that it can be produced, yeah, and then just the traditional pentatonic music after, yeah, 20th century, I think. Yeah. yeah, that reminds me a lot of guitar because guitar tablature is like that too. Because some people, you know, you case then it's like I don't care what tune in. I mean, it's a you know fret three <laughs> or you know for yours yes. it would be a string number. So that's mm -hmm. that's interesting that there's those parallels. I guess just maybe because it's a stringed instrument, maybe there's always be those parallels between tuning and the actual physical thing that you're doing, which string. But I don't think you had ever done that at all. I mean, she just, yeah. I mean, she, she has a perfect pitch and she is able to actually, you know, do it just, you know, based on the Western locations. So, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, she, I mean, she's great. <laughs> well, one interesting, uh, just I, I remember uh, well, I, listen to Chichun's talking about notation, is uh, since we're talking about notation, um, one of the features of traditional notation in Chinese uh, music is uh, the notation is not a, it's, a, it's a, just like a map, right? A lot of uh, style nuances or expressions are created by the performers themselves in China. So you see the notation simple. Uh, probably before the uh, conservatory time, you know, traditional, I mean, in the village or in the, uh, in the past, it's just few notes, even use Chinese character to tell you where the major melody is. Very simple. You cannot learn much from that notation because it's our tradition. You have to learn through your teachers, through your listening, through you get familiar with language. So all the nuance and the stylistic things would be regarded as very important in traditional music are passed through our tradition, not through notation. Mm -hmm. But in contemporary time, in modern time, uh, notation is extremely important. So I remember there are few occasions I don't, I don't, uh, not specifically, but you know, I said, oh, I, I, naturally I'll create something, you know, based on the notation. I think, okay, I can do this. To me, I think it's 
natural, but con to composers, they want some sound specific. They said, oh, probably this. So it could be advantage. And sometimes I need to truly understand what the composers know. So the notation nowadays, Zhishun knows me now. You know, we know each other very well. So when I look at Zhishun's notation, okay, I kind of know what she means because after 22 decades working together, uh, she knows me too. So we're really in each in each other. But the first time I came to the US, when I look at notation, I was like, what? <laughs> and then and I said, why don't you use the piano? Okay, or the harp? Why bother? Why the Gu Zheng? You know, I ask. Uh, and sometimes I said, I remember the, the piece, the dot uh, lines convergence, uh, we pre premiered that piece at Carnegie Hall. And then uh, I was like, Chichun, please say, you know, get, Play, uh, write a uh, you know, movement with a lot of traditional flavor. I just said, okay, 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 very nice, right? And then when the music came, I said, hmm, the, the Jasmine, the folk song, Jasmine, so so famous, it's be become distorted. And Jesus said, yeah, that's what I want. You know, the first moment I, I did not understand what why that's what she wants, you know, the song sounds like this. And then when I play it, become the music, you know, and then, I thought oh, it was brilliant. Yeah, this is the way, you know, we talk about, you know, East, West, you know, this or that. It's it's just language concept, but it is in music, in communication, in this process that uh, I think I, you know, back to open-minded or flexible mind, it's not only led me to uh, understand something new, like opening my mind, but deeper understand how music can can make all of us prosperous, you know, like uh, in music, uh, and become richer and become us, <laughs> original. You know, it's, it's a very fascinating experience. Every every piece working with children, it just uh, yeah, renew my sense of I I feel like I never know this instrument before. I think that's great that you said. Uh, I don't know if you said confluence, but uh, I looked up so the name of the the piece that we'll be hearing. Uh, Suzamenflusses means confluence, which means the merging of two rivers. So that's very right. interesting that you said that. I'm like, perfect tie into that as well. So I guess this is a question for both of you. Well, I know that before we had said that there's a lot of Western people that are, um, you know, writing for this. It's not just an Eastern thing anymore. Is that a new occurrence or is it something that started happening like in the 60s or, you know, kind of during that time after World War to or kind of what's the history of that that you both know i think you know for uh for what i have encountered um people actually has been starting to do it i mean to like arrive for the uh i mean i'm talking about like westerners uh yeah exactly. who, uh, try to actually compose for the traditional instruments not just for the uh chinese but like uh, you know different type of traditional instruments i think it might be like a late um 20th century yeah i mean it, when you're talking about 60s i, I guess um uh, you, if you are talking about uh, a sense, you know, etc., and that that's different, you know, type of uh, situations. Yeah, I mean, it's also used like a uh, common music, etc. Yeah, uh, or later on the John Cage, you know, try some of uh, the the things. But uh, uh, but when I'm talking about like uh, to really more or less like focusing on maybe writing for the Chinese traditional instrument per se, because that's actually one of the things that I um, had encountered uh, for years. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably uh, late uh, 20th centuries, but uh, like uh, uh, early 21st century, mm -hmm. you know, they are really good pieces, blossoms in early 20th, uh, 21st century. I mean, it's so amazing. Like uh, German composers, American composers, you know, uh, I mean, they, they, I mean, some of the pieces just phenomenal. And, you know, it, it is um, for me as a composer, uh, every piece that I compose, uh, I mean, before I compose any piece, I actually tend like to do research 
no matter I'm uh, um, already familiar with the instruments or not, because I also kind of force myself to uh, kind of, you know, uh, looking at whatever things that has been coming new. Yeah. And lately I do actually find out that, oh my God, there are so many great composers there. I mean, I'm talking about Western uh, composers. They are just writing phenomenal ways to, you know, for the traditional instruments and it's, it's, they are effective, very effective. And I have to say that, you know, even myself as an Asian composer, I'm, I'm learning still, you know, I'm, I'm learning from those composers' work as well, you know, and also how, how they deal with the instruments, et cetera. Now, yeah, I mean, there are, there are things that sometimes I might come across, uh, oh, wow, how did they do that? And it might not be so practical, but, you know, again, it's a living experience. And then, you know, it's also, um, I, I mean, yeah, people just get the opportunity to work with performers nowadays. So, like, uh, for instance, Wu Wei, a very uh, famous uh, Shen player. I mean, he lived in Germany for majority of his life nowadays. Yeah. And like Wu or uh, what is it? Uh, the Tianzu, you know, a lot of great European composers, they just write a lot of fantastic pieces for him, you know, for him to premiere with the orchestras in Europe. And and they are very effective as well. So, I mean, it is really not uh, per se that there's, I mean, again, music without boundary anymore. That's the, the conclusion, I think, <laughs> a, a right conclusion nowadays. And it's just like, you know, for me, you know, I'm Taiwanese American, but then I learned how to write for uh, Japanese traditional instruments, the Korean traditional instruments, and I learned the rhythmic concept from Indian, you know, uh, tapas, etc. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is all the learning process. And luckily, we are in the 21st century. The technology is so easy for us to learn things and to encounter, you know, with musicians all around the world. So everything is so possible nowadays. It, you don't even have to, I mean, really have to be in the same room as anyone anymore. I mean, you could literally have a webinar with a composition class and teach them and have them see someone playing it, you know, whereas before, maybe even, I don't know, 20 years ago, I'm sure that would be, I don't even know if that would exist, you know, to do video conferencing at that level. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Exactly. In fact, I really have to say that, you know, although pandemic is such a hardship for all of us, but at the same time, because of the pandemic, they are, you know, it's opened up a different type of possibilities for musicians to encounter globalize. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it is very nice sometimes that I feel, you know, during this time period, I don't need to, you know, take a long flight to go to Europe or go to go, go to U US, you know, for uh, rehearsals and concerts, etc. I can just literally do it by Zoom because technology is so advanced nowadays. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, like what we are doing now. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, exactly. in the past, maybe I had to, you know, buy the flight tickets and I don't have to go down to Tampa and we all have to meet up in Tampa and then mm -hmm. hope to have a concert or something after that. But nowadays, you know, we can just do it all online and we're, you know, we are even in the well, 13 hours difference is time zone now. So mm -hmm. everything is possible. It's that actually quite convenient in the, in the way. Yeah. That's what I thought. I was like, well, also just because of the time difference, it was like, that's great. Um, Cause right now I believe it is, is it hit midnight yet there? <laughs> yeah, it's midnight. It's early for composers. Come on. Yeah. It, we, our life just started. <laughs> I have a deadline okay. tomorrow, tomorrow. So I'm like, oh, no, it's today. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. No. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, so speaking of that, I guess we're getting close to the end. But I guess, like, the last thing maybe I just want to ask, unless there's any more topics that you all had in mind that you really wanted to get out. If not, then 
Well, I, I do want to add something to uh, your last question, where Zhi Chun, uh, what Zhi Chun just answered. Uh, yeah, we, we all appreciate the convenience and this, uh, you know, not two rivers, many rivers, which were just basically drinking one river. Um, but in the 20th century, it's not the case. Uh, I think it's quite, um, uh, it's quite, <laughs> you know, since the beginning of 20th century, when I was in China, what I witnessed is a huge change, you know, when I was born in the late 1970s. And then uh, talking about, you know, Western and Chinese, uh, it was it's a most difficult path for many people because because uh, these two, you know, like Western uh, classical music and Chinese traditional music is entirely two different nature. Like traditional music was not meant for concert music, for virtuosity. It was meant for self-cultivation, communities, you know, music. Uh, so in this conservatory, they want to institu institutionalize and make uh, the music, transform it into a music that can, you know, have a similar function, you know, to public concert. So there are a lot of, 19, I remember 1980s, you know, uh, when China finished the uh, uh, Cultural Revolution. Uh, in fact, the eight model operas was a great example of how Western music and the Chinese music were, were confluenced together to serve political purpose. But besides political purpose, the music itself, you can see a lot of already, you know, uh, mixed together. And then, and when the uh, 1980s, when the door is open, a lot of Chinese um, composers, you know, went to the West. Uh, like now, the leading composers, we know Tan Dun, we know Chen Yi, Zhou Long, you know, in the US. They're all one of the earliest generations came to the US. And then to do this, all multicultural, you know, confluence in the, at the end. Uh, so for for Chinese music, I remember um, it was a time the debate about uh, Xifang Yu means Western music, Zhongguo Yu Chinese music was hot and has been going on again and again about you know how to change the repertoire because the repertoire I played at the beginning was a single melody right traditional very meditative very is for the self and then we need more repertoires for concert stage, so there are new compositions. Use some like chordal, you know, things like Western idea, ABA form, and then, you know, techniques and borrowed sometimes from piano, from harp, and or created just sheer by composers who want to show the virtuosity. It's not negative. It's a, you know, it's a just progress because the function of an instrument become different in the past. And then gradually more composers pouring and then create this vast diversity of repertoires you know just like everyone's being open mind open mind constantly by one after another of new repertoires and that's in early 1990s and then again and again you know until when i met Chichun in late you know beginning of 21st 21st century it's like uh the world is totally, you know, like open world uh, kind of warm. It's just open up, and everything is possible. So, uh, but the debate about because music has their own identity. They think, oh, it, whether this is a truly presented the, the, the instrument, that's another big topic. But I think it's just fascinating, you know, in the last few decades, saw the transformation, you know, single instrument, the transformation of the single instrument, and my, I, my personally, uh, experience lucky enough to. Grow from uh, grow up in China, all this system, and then come here two decades more with Zhichun, you know, and other composers to witness and to understand what's going on, you know, in this world, different side of the world. But at the end, it confluence, it <laughs> merge together to create a fantastic music scene on this instrument. So it's interesting what you just said, um, and I think this will go into the next question too, kind of saying, is this the correct way to use the instrument or is this kind of uh, abusing it? And I think it was the question that I was going to ask both of you is like, I know it's come up and we've, people have learned about it more, you know, as we've gotten into the 21st century, but um, what can we do to kind of expose more people to it and then also expose it in a I guess a way that represents it right, you know, because I know some people you could maybe think, oh, well, I'm going to have a, a part that sounds Chinese in my piece. Oh, I'll just use pentatonic. I'm like, well, it's a lot. It's, you know, there's a lot of complexities to this music. I don't know. Just maybe talk about that for our, our last kind of ending question is like, how do we represent this music and this whole body of tradition in a way that uh, I guess isn't offensive, maybe <laughs> as Westerners, you know, as somebody, if I was going to write a piece, 
for uh, Zhang, you know, what's the interesting things I should keep in mind and, and how do we expose that and make it just something that we all know in university, you know, that we learn about, every composer learns about? Well, one thing I learned from Zhi Chun is that uh, I used to have that question a lot. And a, a lot of my Chinese listeners, they have that question too. Is that it's not sound like Gu Zheng, you know, it's I, because uh, the comfortable, to get out of comfortable zone is difficult. And then, uh, but now I don't think the question in this way. I think there's no this or that, you know, as you did, we just talked about now is very, is, is, you know, everything is possible. Everything is unique. I think as long as uh, the composer express, uh, they have to do the research, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And then best to use the instrument uh, in whatever way, as long as it reflect its own, you know, his or her own unique thought. Like Zhi Chun gave this great examples of her new pieces. Everyone is not just for sheer novelty or just, she did a lot of research based on her own culture background and understanding and her own vision. And this is it. There's nothing you have, you cannot say this is a Chinese or a Western. It's, it's just shallowed the, the perspective. I think it's, you know, it's like uh, we back up from the something true. We just see the sign. No, I think it's in this case for like when I, when I play children piece, I never thought this, this or that. I just play, this is the music I play. This is on the Zheng. And then I think it's very, whatever name you give, you know, title or label is, is there. It's just uh, it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I think that's the best way to understand music is like, take out all the labels of my mind, because that is my, uh, narrow, narrowing my mind, narrowing perception is like uh, boxes I put on. I think the best way to approach uh, new music is without any box, just being open as a musician, that it doesn't matter where you come from and uh, wholehearted um, present what the composer's original thought and wholehearted uh, express what I feel. So I think that's the best way to approach new music. To your point, what you just said, I think that you can tell when somebody has put the effort in to learning about it and oh. it's not just a novelty and no matter what they do, you can still feel like, oh, they've, they've known how, they know I can do this. I know they know this little traditional thing maybe that might, they might do, but then it's in 12 tone, you know? So I think it's just it, learning and showing that, yeah. Yeah, it's very obvious, you know, good uh, or mediocre. It's okay. It's all okay. It's a learning process. And then uh, regardless, uh, you know, what level the repertoire is, there's always something uh, like inspiring. So uh, for musicians, I think the, the job is to interpret the piece well. Yeah, I think, you know, as a composer, I mean, like, uh, yeah, when we were talking about using the traditional instruments, but then uh, how we actually, you know, identify or, or how, how we, you know, define, you know, of actually using the traditional instruments, et cetera. For, for me, okay, traditional instrument, yes, it does actually carry tradition for sure. I'm talking about the history parts, yeah. And so that says that, you know, like for instance, Gu Zhen, you know, uh, Hai Chong mentioned that there are, you know, several different uh, schools, different styles that, you know, from the traditional. So there are certain type of bending techniques, certain, you know, uh, very elegant ways of uh, treating the South nose, you know, part of the, the music that is traditionally treated. Those still would be my consist considerations as well. But at the meantime, you know, for me, when I start to deal with the instruments, not only carry the tradition, but also, you know, extend the possibility of and entering the contemporary music world that says that I'm hoping that when people encounter, you know, any of my music, no matter it's for the traditional instruments or Western instruments or whatsoever, they can somehow come across of a label, ah, this is the tradition, this music. That, that's mm -hmm. what I'm searching for. That's what I have been living up my life for. Yeah. So, you know, it, the instrument, it's a tour. It's, you know, it's a way of to approach this goal. Yeah. So, you know, the way that I deal with the, um, 
the uh, the traditional instrument like gu zhen, et cetera, you know, would not be too much differences in the way that I deal with the, you know, violins or percussions, et cetera. So like, you know, make a very uh, quick example um, like Zurin Francis, when I wrote this piece, I mean, the, uh, it's actually for Guzhen and the percussion. And the primary percussion instrument actually is a vibraphone and then a, 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 a cymbal. But the way the, of the, the conferences in between of uh, uh, Guzhen and the vibraphone, especially in the middle sections, when we're you know, dealing with the harmonic concept from the Guzhen and the vibraphone, my idea was purely just for people you know, any audience cross their eyes, they would be amazed. They didn't even, they would not even be able to guess which sound is from which instrument. It's how that, you know, the, the, the temper uh, games, you know, the, the encounters of the, the tempers, you know, the emergence of, you know, different sounds, you know, although they are from completely two different instruments, but they can be, you know, together with the perfect marriage, even though one is from West, one is from East. So that's kind of my approach, you know, when I deal with, you know, using the uh, traditional instruments or Western instruments, et cetera. Very nice. I, I can see that now, listen to hearing the piece in my head where it's, they kind of both present themselves as two different things and then, yeah, really become yeah. one thing. It's, it's kind of fun because, you know, in a way, especially like, you know, for this particular piece, I have been trying to imitate Gu Zhen from Biberfeng. At the same time, I also use, you know, Gu Zhen to imitate uh, uh, Guzen to imitate the vibraphone and vibraphone to imitate Guzen. So they are like a encount they are like a going across in each other's world, even though they are completely di different instruments. So again, that's what we are talking about the compositional mindset and uh, you know how we print out the blueprints, you know, how we compose the piece. And I think that's in the way in conclusion is much more meaningful. Uh, meaningful way of uh, approach and then actually thinking about oh okay all the barriers etc okay you know i'm treating I, i'm doing you know, i'm writing for for traditional ch uh, chinese instrument it has to be sounds like a traditional asian instrument sounding no it is not that anymore mm -hmm. just like you know when i'm dealing with violins etc i can make them just sounds like an asian traditional instrument too like uh, who etc i can you know using certain type of techniques to make the violin become completely different instruments yeah than, than they than who they are originally so i mean right now it's all about like uh, you know borrowing different techniques from each other and have fun you know really true to be told being a composer the best part is to have fun you know if we don't have enjoyment enjoyment of doing this this then this task will be much too difficult for any human being, true to, true to be told, because, you know, like what we say that it is already past midnight, your composer is still awake. You know, who on the earth want to be, have this crazy life if we don't really in love with it? And it's because, you know, okay, we are thinking, about, okay, you know, I have to come up with some piece, some idea that it is, you know, it, it can, you know, I can have fun with, you know, the process. Also, I'm hoping the end result of my piece can also bring, a, you know, a, a very positive weight of uh, the conclusions for the audience. So, so, you know, I'm hoping that, that they can somehow, you know, have some sort of enjoyment from my music or my combination of, you know, creations as well. So, yeah, that's kind of, you know, my my philosophy as a composer using yeah, different instruments, etc. Awesome. Well, I think that's a good uh, way to end. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess... Uh, unless there was no other comments, uh, I guess we could leave it with um, what you two are doing, some some events coming up. I know we're playing Chishun's piece, um, but is there anything else that you want to note that's coming up for you? Well, uh, maybe uh, I should mention one of uh, my uh, long-time project I want to finish is to uh, release an album, an album of um, all the contemporary pieces on the Zheng composed by Zhichun. 
Yes, this is my this is a, a, down, a daunting task. Uh, luckily, you know, we 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 we, uh, we have some recordings already, and I need to record at least two more pieces. Um, but I think uh, one of the uh, reason I want to do it is not only um, you know have this recording available, but also to let more people, uh, you know, people not only Western but people in Asian parts uh, parts know. There's a people here devoted, you know, years, you know, after midnight still writing <laughs> music <laughs> on this instrument, and uh, through music, um, you know, let this fun and joy, this uh, joy and this open, you know, this no boundary type of feeling and the mindset can permit more people, get in touch with more people, and inspire more people to um, be just relax and breathe and creative enough to continue write great music for uh, any instrument, you know, any human, <laughs> uh, I mean, any countries, you know, for just for, yeah, in sheer enjoyment of human beings, I think that's the essence, uh, really. Without that, it's difficult for, for performers to, to practice, <laughs> even. So, yeah, I, I definitely, uh, uh, you know, uh, be with a children because that's the major thing can let me continue this thing is that enjoyment at the end this uh, mind opening inspiring uh, through her music with beyond language she doesn't have to say anything just within that notes i understand her and understand myself it's all connected so touched you know i have to say that you know as a composer i mean it it, it is definitely a greatest blessing you know, to actually have an encounter with, you know, such a great performer like Hai Chong. And just as a composer, normally we encounter a, a lot of commissions or, or, and, and then it comes with like a, a condition, type of commissions. Like people will tell you, oh, I only want this. I only want that. You know, it cannot be too difficult. It cannot be, to be this, that, you know, whatsoever. And I have to say, you know, Working with Hai Chong has been a wonderful, you know, experience up to date because, you know, I remember when I, the first commission that I worked with her, the first thing she said, do whatever you want. I'm like, yo, yeah, I'm hitting a <laughs> jetpack because, you know, what on the earth can we actually do whatever we want, you know, as a composer, especially in a commission type of situation that the people are really light up for the concert. It's like, a, yes. You know, yeah, so I mean, it was really, you know, wonderful. Yeah, it has been a, a great experience. And, and, and truth to be told, yeah, I mean, I, I cannot wait, you know, to have this CD project to be done. Yeah, and it will be a, you know, our long term documentations for, for what we have been, you know, together for uh, working as a performers and, and, and great friends, really, yeah, for, I mean, since 1998 up to date, yeah. Uh -huh. So that that's definitely, yeah, very looking forward to it, for sure. Yeah, that, I look forward to that too. And when that comes out, we will put it out on the camp website, whenever that is. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, thank you very much for being here. And uh, that's where we'll leave it for today. So thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Jesus. Thank you. So nice to talk to you both. It was so nice. Thank you for listening to Play the Ink. Stay tuned for more episodes with this list of hopeful guests. Percussionist Ben Reimer and composer Nicole Lise. Composer Michael Timpson and a performer to be determined. Percussionist Ayun Huang and composer violinist Mari Kimura and percussionist Fabrice Marandola and composer Philippe Lacroix.